Amen. First Peter chapter one, verses three through five. I thought it was interesting that that a lot, a lot of the songs that we sang this morning are related to the message that the Lord has prepared. And it was a moving of the spirit because Rosalind doesn't call me and ask me what songs you want me to sing. You know, because that would be a waste of time because I don't know the songs out there. I'm not a worship leader, nor do I keep track of all the different different songs and so forth. So I just thought it was interesting that a lot of the songs were directed towards our salvation and how we should be appreciative of that, you know, and glorify God because he loves us so much and so forth. So I thought that was interesting. There's an inheritance that every man, woman, and child has that has been given to us by God. I believe that every person on the face of the earth has this, has this inheritance already. And it's available to every one of them. I believe that salvation is available to every person. You know, there's a scripture that talks about the book of life. And it says that if your name is in the book of life, that it will be blotted out. I think that the reason that it says it in that way is because every name, every person is already in the book of life. Doesn't mean that they're saved. Doesn't mean that they're going to heaven. It means that their names are there. It means that salvation is available to all. That there's no one that is is limited or excluded from salvation. There's a point in time of each individual's life where God touches their soul, their spirit, and they become born again. And then that light, in a sense, lights up. And that spirit and that person now is a part of the kingdom of God. So we have an inheritance. Every man, woman, and child, and God has given us that inheritance. What is an inheritance? A young man asked an old rich man how he made all of his money. And the old guy, you know, kind of pulled on his wool coat there and he says, Well, son, back in 1932, there was a Great Depression. And there I was with a nickel in my pocket. And so I went and I bought me a shiny apple. And I polished it and polished it and polished it. And I went down the street and I sold it for a dime. Then I took that dime and I bought two apples. And I polished those two apples and I sold them each for a dime and there by the end of the month I made a dollar 37 and the kid says wow so that's where all your wealth came from and he says oh heavens no my father died and left me his inheritance <laughs> an inheritance is something that someone leaves you that someone ha- has been storing up for you uh, we have an inheritance from God that is in heaven though we don't have it yet And we don't see it yet. We see glimpses of it, but we will see it when we get to heaven. And God will finally give it to us, our Father, who has that inheritance. That inheritance is available for anyone. And that inheritance is salvation. In John 3.16, we know it so well. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's whoever. No one is excluded. The Bible is clear the the gospel is to every creature that God has created on the face of the earth. And I'm speaking creature as human beings, man, woman and child. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And all it takes is a calling from the heart to the Lord. And then John tells us in chapter 1 verse 12, As many as received him, that is the gospel message in Jesus Christ in their hearts, to them he gave them to be the right to become children of God, to those who believed in him. They've now become children of God because they have received the gospel message. They have received God into their hearts. They have become born again because they believed and now they have the right to become children of God. They are now children of God. And as children of God, there is an inheritance that God has given to us. Dave Hunt, who was a, a, a great commentator on the Word of God, I read a lot of his articles, uh, very deep, very clear articles on various subjects and doctrines of the Bible. He has already gone and passed away, and he's also in the presence of the Lord. I, I just heard that his wife just passed away this last week, so she is now in the presence of the Lord. 
But he writes this uh, article on um, the election of God and why. And I thought it was interesting because there's just a section I want to focus on, a, a section of truth that, that I think is, is, is going to, in a sense, uh, prove what I just said uh, earlier. It says, numerous scriptures focus us to conclude that all of mankind has been chosen to salvation by the God who would have all men to be saved in 1 Timothy 2.4. God also said that he rather none should perish, no, not one, but they all come to know him. The Savior of all men, specifically of those that believe and whose Son gave himself a ransom for all, if all have been chosen to salvation, why are all not saved? Christ said to his disciples, Have I not chosen you twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas. That should betray him. Judas was one of those chosen to be a disciple, but through his own choice, he did not fulfill that calling and is now in hell. God said to Israel, the Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. That choosing did not automatically assure that all Israel would live the part. Unfortunately, Israel as a whole did not fulfill that calling, but went into sin. And God had to cast her out of the land. From these and other scriptures, it is clear that being chosen... To salvation does not bring salvation. One must still believe the gospel in order to be saved. So, we are all chosen, but we need to make a choice to choose Him in order to bring salvation into our hearts. And so we're going to talk about this salvation of ours and how great it is and how we need to rejoice. We shouldn't be sitting around with long faces. We shouldn't be saddened by the elements that are going on in the world today. We should be rejoicing because our names are written in the book of life. We have a home in heaven that God is preparing for us. This isn't our home. And I know it's so easy to get involved in this world and the things of this world, but it's not our home. We're pilgrims, as Peter said and James said and even Jesus said. This isn't our home our home is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about those things. Last week we saw Peter introduce a writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Those Gentiles that dwelled in modern day Turkey today who were elected according to the foreknowledge of God, sanctified by the Spirit and for obedience because of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to look at our spiritual inheritance. So let's look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me stop there and let's look at this. The word blessed, the Greek word is eulogize. Interesting. Now just hold on to that word. It's a word that we often use at funerals when we eulogize or do a eulogy for someone. The Greek word is yolagaetos. Now, to be, blessed be the God, that is his theos, the deity, the father of our. Now, highlight our because he's our father. He is our God. And he should be personally your God and father. Lord, meaning having authority, Jesus Christ. The word Jesus Christ is Christ's name, which is Jehovah Savior. Christ is not his name. Christ means anointed. That is, he was anointed to be the Messiah. And so when we say Jesus Christ, we're not saying Jesus and his last name is Christ. We're saying Jesus, the anointed one, to be the Messiah and Savior of the world. Now, I like the Amplified Translation, it says, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philip says, thank God, thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in another translation, let the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be eulogized, eulogized. Eulogy means to praise highly. You're at a funeral and you take the opportunity to, to remember that individual that has passed away. And so you have a time of eulogy 
where you start talking about the good times and you praise them and how good they were at this and how good were they were at that. And you never talk about how bad they were, but you talk about how good they were and so forth. And that's the word that Peter is using here, that we are to praise highly. But but it's it's not in a sense that he's praising highly. He's asking the reader to praise God highly. That's us. That's you and me. We should be praising God for our inheritance that God has prepared for us. That is raising hands, lifting up our voices, singing unto Him, because we have eternal life. Now, the word is never used in reference to man. It's always used with God being the one that is praised and not man. Man is to praise God. He is our Father. McGee said that in our culture today, we hear fathers praising their sons. It's very, it isn't very often that we find a son praising his father. But we are to praise God, our father. Isn't that interesting? And we got it backwards. When you look at the Trinity, that's basically what's happening. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have the Father who is the head, and He leads, and He guides, and He directs. Jesus who follows, and He points people to the Father. He did the work of the Father. And then you have the Holy Spirit who's silent. And in a sense, you can see that as a family. The, the Father, as He leads. The wife, as she submits unto the Father, and his, his will, the husband. And then you see the children who are to reflect Jesus and the Father. They're to praise Jesus and the Father. The Holy Spirit never draws attention to Himself. It's always to Jesus and the Father. And so children should reflect their parents and never the opposite. Now Peter gets a little excited here. I mean, he's thinking about this election, right? That God has chosen us because of His foreknowledge. Because He knew that we chose Him. And so he gets a little excited and he says, Blessed! Praise highly. I mean, there's a lot of things to get excited about, but that's one thing that Peter really gets excited about is his salvation. What is the implications there? The work of salvation by God is something to get excited about. We have eternal life. Our names are written in the book of life. If you were to enter into heaven and there's a register there, they'd look through it and see, oh, your name is here. You're more than welcome to come on in. If your name wasn't there, you'd be very sad and you'd be very upset. But our names are written in that book of life and that's something to get excited about. He saved us from our old life and has given us a new life. And we're no longer those old creatures. We're no longer those sinners that that continue to sin habitually against God's will. But now we are new creatures in Christ Jesus and now we don't want to sin and so we sin less and we're excited to And the fact that our home is not here, but it is in heaven. And Peter, like the Old Testament psalmist, begins to just praise the Lord and ask us to join him in praising God. Uh, You read the psalmist and you see that relationship that the psalmists have with God. And they praise God for everything. That last psalm, 150. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We should be praising the Lord a lot more than we do. We should be singing and focused on what God has done for us when we sing these songs. The Amplified Bible says, Praise or honor and bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you appreciate your salvation? That is a good question to ask. I thought about this question. Do I really appreciate my salvation? How many of us even think about our salvation? We don't think about it too often, do we? We get so busy with with our jobs... You know, we're making money to support our family so that we can go out and have a good time and buy little toys and things like this. And we don't really think about our salvation. You know, we come to church and then we serve at church, whether it's out there or setting up and and we're serving and we're doing this because we love the Lord and we love our brothers and we want to prepare the place. But we rarely think about our salvation. We rarely think about eternal life. We almost take it for granted in a sense. And I know how easy that is to do. Because I don't wake up in the morning saying, thank you for my salvation, Lord. I used to do that. I don't do it as often as I do because I know that I have my salvation. And I know that I'm already going to heaven. I understand all that. But Peter is reminding us how great a salvation it is. And we need to be reminded of that salvation quite often. That you have eternal life. 
that your home is in heaven. And that one day, one day, you'll see Jesus face to face. I can't wait for that day. I'm excited about that day. And we're just talking out there. Chuck's already been there for a couple of weeks before the presence of the Lord. And I'm sure there was a great crowd of witnesses when he entered in, along with many, many others. I hope there's just one person that sees me as I enter in, because I know I haven't done much. I can't wait for that day. I'm excited about that day. Why praise him? Look at the next statement. Who according to his abundant mercies or compassion... Uh, that mercy is not getting what you deserve. What do we deserve? Hell. That's something to get excited about. We deserve hell. We deserve separation from God. We deserve to be punished for our sins. And I can think back from, from this point on, and I can remember a lot of sins that I have committed that I didn't get busted for, you know, that I got away with. And yet God still had mercy, compassion upon my soul. And it says, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, interesting words, has begotten us again. That word in the Greek is, be, is begotten or begat. He, he has begat us. He, he's already provided salvation for us. In other words, we are born again. It's the same word as born again. And Peter's using that word born again. I wonder if Peter was listening to Jesus and Nicodemus when Jesus says, Nick, you have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. Because he uses that word here and he understands that this born again is to a living hope. A living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's a living hope. We know that there's an eternal state. We know there's a heaven. We know there's a throne and Jesus sits upon it. And it's through the blood of Jesus Christ by the resurrection. We are born again by God's mercies, not by your works, not by your good looks, though all of you are beautiful. It's not anything that you can do, but it's by God's mercies alone. Praise be to God that he did the work on the cross Mercy is referred to an outward manifestation of pity. God literally having pity upon us that we cannot even save our own souls. And he had mercy on us. The idea is to show kindness or concern for someone who is in serious need. Are we in serious need? (laughs) We sure are, aren't we? If you're living in sin right now, you're in great need of the Lord. If you're practicing sin right now, you're in great need of the Lord. In fact, you're jeopardizing your name that is written in the book of life if you continue to practice that sin. Because the Bible is clear in Galatians, Ephesians, Corinthians, and it talks about the list of things that will not enter the kingdom of God. And those practicing sins tells us very clear. And Paul even said, and I tell you again, You will not enter the kingdom of God. So if you are in sin, you're in great need for the Lord's mercy, for the Lord's pity. What does it mean to be born again? That's an interesting statement. We hear it all the time. It seems like we hear it less today than ever before. I remember when I first got saved, uh, one of the words that were used quite often was born again. I'm a born again Christian. And then the secular world seemed to grab that and they started talking about them being born again, born again into this, born again into that. Even some of the spiritualists use it now. We're born again. The world's born again. We're new in this theology or that spiritual thing. And so it's kind of been diluted and misused uh, along with John 3.16, right? You we used to see that everywhere. Don't see it as, as often. Even the old, I don't know, some of you remember this sign? Anybody remember this sign? How many remember this sign? It's the one-way sign, right? I remember doing that out in the window when I first got saved and just the people or a bunch of Christians like this and they all go like this. One way. There's only one way to heaven. It was very clear. We knew what it meant. No one even knows what this means anymore. Are you pointing at me? No, I'm I'm not pointing at you. I'm saying Jesus is the only way. They used to even make shirts with the finger going up like that too. You know, but we lose track of meanings and definitions and so forth. What does it mean to be born again? Turn to John 3. And Jesus makes it so clear, so simple as to what it means to be born again. John chapter 3 with Nicodemus, who came at night 
<clears throat> Nick at night <clears throat> had a question. So there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I mean, they saw that. They knew that. These were the religious leaders. These were the elite. And they were viewing and watching Jesus. And they understood. This guy's different. He's doing signs and wonders. So, so I know that you've come from God. Because nobody can do these things. And Jesus stopped him right in his tracks before he could go on and even say another word. And he said, Nick, most assuredly I say to you, verse 3, unless one is born again, He cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one. He's not saying, Nick, unless you are born again. He says, unless one, that is all of us, need to be born again. We're not excluded from this. You have to ask the question, am I born again? And what does that mean to be born again? Because I want to make sure that I'm born again. The thought that came into my mind when I first read this scripture over 25 years ago is like, can I go back into my mother's womb? What is he talking about? I have to be rebirthed? Is he talking about reincarnation? You know, reincarnation where I have to be born into another being, a rat or a cow or an animal or another, you know, human being of some sort? What is he talking about? Well, Jesus makes it pretty, pretty clear here. It says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water, And of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so he just broke it up into twos. Unless one is born of water and one of the Spirit. So whatever is born of water and of the Spirit is born again and you get to go to heaven. Then he breaks it up even more. That that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. It's very clear. So many commentators just, uh, they try to pull in other scriptures, other books to, to clarify this. But if you stay with the context, I think Jesus is clear. He, he's speaking and he's flowing. He's saying there's two things. You have to be born of water and spirit. And then he says the flesh and then of spirit. So what he's saying is you have to have a natural birth. Because in order to be born again, guess what? You have to be here. <laughs> you have to be alive. You, you've had to have a birth. That's first. Now, the second is the spirit needs to be born. Ah, so there's the key. The spirit that dwells within every human being needs to be born again. Come alive, in other words. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So, what does that mean then? My spirit, has my spirit come alive? Am I born again? What happens to you when your spirit comes alive? Now, if I were to ask and give some opportunities here for testimonies. I think a lot of you come and say, this is what happened to me. You know? here, there I was walking down the road and a sinner and doing all this, drugs and all this other stuff. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes into my life. And my life changed. Something went on. And I just decided to drop it all and serve Him. And there will be a lot of testimonies like that. I, I, I started to look up testimonies, and it's amazing how many testimonies that people have written on the Internet and how God has come into their lives. Do you have a testimony? I know people that say, I don't know when I was saved. I don't know when my born again experience. Really? You need to know. I think that everyone has one. And if you haven't had one, then my question is, are you born again? And that's what we want to settle this morning. Are you born again? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul dealt with this issue of being born again. He made it so clear just as, as he did in Galatians 6.15 when he said it's not the, circumc- or the circumcision or uncircumcision that availeth anything, but it's the new creation. Paul is talking in Galatians about, uh, about the law. And how the Jews keep the law and the Gentiles don't keep the law. How the Jews circumcised and the Gentiles did not circumcise. Paul said, Doesn't, none of that has anything to do with it. What matters is the circumcision of the heart. That you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's what matters. It's the new creation that God has created in you. Look at what it says in verse 17. Therefore, of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... If you are in Christ, if you proclaim to know Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, He is. He might be. 
He will be sometimes. No, he is a new creation. You are. Now you take that by faith. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am by faith because I have Christ and Christ is in me. And so by faith, I am a new creation. That means I'm brand new. And he goes on and says, old things have passed away. Your old life has passed away. The things you did have passed away. The things you were involved have passed away. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't it like a birth when you come to the Lord? It really is like a birth. I remember when I got, I got saved. And I only share this not, not to talk about myself and how great I am, but as a testimony of what God can do in our lives. Because He can do this in your life too. There I was... Finally, after growing up in a poor home and, and, and then having two children, three actually, and then one on the way, and then I got a job for Southern California Edison, started to finally make some money. But as I was making that money, I started to misuse it on myself because I had children at an early age, and so I wanted to catch up on all the fun. So I started to go out a lot on my wife. Go to Tuesday nights, you know, happy hour at bars and, and dance clubs. And then I used to go and, uh, you know, take a little bit of coke before we go out there and smoke some marijuana and, and those type of things. And, and I used to get involved in a lot of the, the th- thievery and stuff that's around all of that. And there I was just trying to enjoy life, try to have fun and so forth. And then all of a sudden, I don't know why, the Spirit of God just in my mind says, why don't you listen to some Christian radio? So I just put it on AM and turned on K-Bright and like, why would I want to do that? <laughs> you know, I don't know why. And I did. And there came Greg Laurie. And he just, he just laid out my whole life from the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if you lust for a woman, you've committed adultery. I'm like, oh man, that's what the Bible says? Yeah, I've done that. If you hate your brother, if you hate anyone, you've committed murder. I'm like, wow, I've done that. And I knew at that moment, before God, because it was just me and my truck, listening to Greg on the radio, out there, and who knows where, I think it was Crestline at the time, and I knew at that very moment that I was a sinner and I was going to hell. I knew that. And there was no hope for me. In fact, at that moment, I lost all hope, and I thought, wow, wow. In my mind, you know how your mind can think a hundred million things at once. I'm thinking, might as well party till you die because, you know, it's all over and you're going straight to hell. And then all of a sudden, Greg comes on and says, but you don't have to go to hell. And he offered the hope of Jesus Christ through his blood. And I just like, I'll take it. And I'll tell you, it was like a rebirth because when I accepted that, All of a sudden, I felt like a weight just come off of my shoulders. Like all my sins were forgiven. I confessed them before him. I confessed them that I was a sinner. I was wretched. I'm no good. And I approached the rest of my walk that way. In humility. Knowing that I am nothing and Christ is everything. And from that point on, my life literally, literally took a 180 degree turn. I started sharing with people and they were just like, yeah, right, no way. I stopped drinking, I stopped partying, I stopped doing things, just completely, just boom, just like that. It was that dramatic in my life. And I knew that I was a totally new creature in Christ Jesus, that old things have passed away. Now, you know, later on as you grow up, those things want to come back (laughs) because the enemy knows you. He knows those things that uh, trigger certain things in you. So they try to creep back in and you've got to just keep fighting them. Because you're a new creature in Christ. And by faith, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. So being born again, there's an experience there where God changes you. Your mind, your heart, your whole attitude, everything. Your desires, your wants, everything changes completely. No longer desiring certain things and wanting other things. Church, that was one thing. I, like, I need to go to church. What, what church should we go to? It has to be a Bible teaching church because I need to learn the Bible. So we tried going back to Catholicism and I would sit there and like, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. I'm shriveling up. There's no food. There's no water here. Finally, I said, we need to find a church. And my wife was just kind of like, what are you talking about? A church that feeds you. And she had no idea because she wasn't born again yet. And so she had no idea. And when we found the Calvary Chapel, it was like, yeah, I'm home. We're going through the Bible and we're reading verse by verse. And I'm just soaking it up, eating up, and just feel alive. I'm hydrated, everything. And she's just like, I think I want to go to the Catholic Church. 
And I'm like, yeah, you go ahead. You go. Because being born again means you're willing to deny everybody, including your wife and your family, to follow Christ. I says, you go. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to be fed. And the Lord started to draw her back and say, man, I've been trying to get him to go to church for a long time. So she stayed. And then all of a sudden she became born again. A new creature in Christ. And then my sons become born again. Then my mom becomes born again. And then my sisters become born again. And it just began to flow and flow and flow and flow. That's a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Born again means renewal again or born from above. Born from above to father anew, to bring forth again, to regenerate, cause to be born again completely. I like what C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity. God became man to turn creatures into sons. Not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. It is not like teaching a horse to jump better and better, but like turning a horse into a winged creature. Get that idea. Because that explains it very well. See, sometimes people approach Christianity, oh, I'm just going to be better. I'll just be better at what I was good at before. No. God wants to make you completely different. He wants to put wings on you where you're going, whoa, where did these come from? You know, this isn't taking what I was good at before. You know, hey, I'm a good moral guy. I didn't cuss. I didn't swear. Didn't go with women that did either. You know, that that type of thing. No, God isn't making you better. God's making you completely new. And that's what C.S. Lewis is saying. Can you imagine having wings? That's totally new. And that's the born-again experience. We are born again to a living hope. A living hope. Why be born again? Why? Because it's a living hope, an eternal hope. God is preparing us for that living hope in heaven. Someone said this is our living hope, the expectation of being taken home to heaven to be with Christ and to be like Him forever and ever. A born-again person. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Without the resurrection, our hope is nothing. Right? Because Jesus is still in the grave. He's still in a coffin. Sepulcher. And so, because of the resurrection, that is, He resurrected from the dead, He ascended into heaven, so we have the same living hope. So, Peter now writes more about this born-again life in verse 4. He says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. The word reserved in the Greek means guarded. Who is guarding our salvation? Because our salvation is an inheritance that's incorruptible. It doesn't corrode. It doesn't fade away. It's not defiled by wickedness or evil. It is everlasting. And that's Peter's point here, that nobody can take it away from us. Nobody can take it away from us. They can take away your clothes, your cars, but they can't take away your salvation. You know, they can take away this building, but they can't take away our faith in Christ. There there was one day we came in on a Sunday morning, and the door to the kitchen is usually where we come in, and it was open. And so we walked in, and myself and my wife probably and the kids when they were little and also we look and there's trash all over and we went into the room the windows were broken open so they'd come in through the window taking all this the speakers and some of the sound system they had eggs and they were throwing eggs at the at the walls and and things like this and you know at at first it was just like it was like how could someone do this you know to have the nerve to come into the house of God, you know, and, and do this to the Lord. And I almost took it personally at first, too. But then the Lord just reminded me, this is all perishing. This is all nothing. And they haven't done anything to the Lord that they didn't do 2,000 years ago on the cross. You know? See, they, can't, they can take away all this stuff. They can, they can defame this stuff, but they can't take away what's in our hearts. It's incorruptible. It's undefiable. It's never fading away. It's eternal. And when you have it, you have it, and no one's going to take it. It's like heaven is a safe deposit box for what God is guarding as our inheritance when we get there. An inheritance is reserved for us, for you and I in heaven when we get there. Look at verse 5. Who are kept 
by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The word kept there is a military term, and it literally means garrison. It's a Roman army that is guarding our inheritance in heaven. Talk about Fort Knox. See, there's no way anybody could break into there and take our inheritance. Isn't God good that He protects us in our inheritance forever by that power, that deutimus, where we get the word dynamite? And it's through faith, which is a future faith of salvation. There are three tenses of salvation. You have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Three tenses. In the past, we were saved somewhere. We were born again. And now today, as we sit here, we are being saved because we're being taught. We're understanding what it means to be saved. We're understanding that we need to be born again. We need to be new creatures. You know. And by the way, how do you do that? You pray if you're not. If you have questions, then you pray and ask God, help me to be born again. Make me completely new, Lord. Get on your faces and cry out to God and ask Him to make you completely new. And He'll do it. It's not a sinner's prayer like we think, you know. That's the beginning of it. Yeah, make a stand, raise your hand. I ask Christ into my heart. Now go home and really seek God to make you into that new creature in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> it's being guarded by a garrison in heaven. <clears throat> Let me close. Jesus is wonderful. He's everlasting. He's all powerful. And really, He is the great guard of our hearts. There's a read in Daily Bread. It said, years ago, a team of mountain climbers began to began a dangerous descent of one of the peaks in Swiss Alps. The first man in the line lost his foothold and slipped over the ledge. The next two men were dragged after him, but the experienced climbers above braced themselves and stood firm to bear the shock. And when the rope ran its length, rather than bearing the weight, it snapped like a string. Horrified, the climbers saw their friends fall to their death on the glacier 4,000 feet below. For half an hour, the other three stayed immobilized with fear. Finally, they nerved themselves to continue their perilous descent. Hours later, they arrived in, in this Zermatt to tell their sad story. When the climbers ex examined the rope to find out why it failed, they were shocked. True alpine club rope had a red strand running through it but this rope did not it was a weak substitute the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only strong thing the only strand that will really hold us together that's why Peter said that there's only one way that's why Jesus said he was the way that's why Paul said there's no other name under heaven given by which you can be saved. It's only through Jesus Christ and He is the strand that holds us together. He guards all of that. Your faith is not in yourself. Your faith is not in some goodness act that you might do or some rope. Your faith is in Jesus Christ alone. And when you have that faith in Jesus Christ, you are born again. Are you born again? <clears throat> I think the law condemned Nicodemus and he knew it. I'm sure he had all kinds of questions from the Old Testament to ask Jesus. But Jesus said, look, Nick, the law is not going to save you. Your religious acts won't save you. It's only a new birth that will save you. And Nick had to receive that new birth. And later on, we do see that Nicodemus did. He was a witness to the resurrection. Took the body down from the cross also and helped Joseph to bury that body of Jesus. Because he became born again. Are you born again? I don't know if you're born again or not. As I look, I see all of you, and I know all of you proclaim to be Christians. I proclaim to be a Christian, but are you born again? If you're not this morning, then I'd like to pray for you. I want to just ask God to create in your heart that new creature that he has intended you to be. And to remove all the desires of the world, all the desires of these things that hold us back and give us new desires. A new desire to serve here in the church. A new desire to serve Him wherever He wants us to go. 
wherever He wants to take us. Let's bow our heads. Father, I just want to pray for Your people, Lord. If there's anyone here, Lord, this morning that that needs to be that new creature, maybe the old sin has come and creeped in again, Lord, and we need to remove that. We need strength to beat it, Lord. Father, we want to pray for those, Lord. Lord, maybe those that think, yeah, I've accepted Christ, and yeah, I come to church, but nothing's really changed in my life. I'm still desiring the same things that I did before. I want to desire new things. I'm speaking to the that person right now. Just raise your hand if you want to be new in Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You just want that old person to go away. Just raise your hand. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Father, you saw the hands and we pray in the name of Jesus and by His blood and resurrection that you, through your Spirit, would begin to work in the hearts of those that raise their hands, Lord. That you would begin to fashion and mold in their hearts that new creation, Father. That you would remove the old life, that old person, Lord. The desires for those things in the world, Lord. The lust, the eyes, the flesh, Lord. Remove them completely, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord. We pray for their hearts that it would be new, Lord. Their minds would be renewed, Lord. And Lord, that they would hunger for you and thirst for you, Lord God. That in the mornings they'd wake up thinking about you. In the evenings they would be praying to you as they're falling asleep, Lord. That they can't get you off of their minds, Lord. Create in them a new creature, Father. Create in them in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that for all of us, Lord. That we continue to walk with the Lord in newness of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.